Well, hello. Welcome to BSL Blethers. And tonight's topic is how to improve your home to make it more dementia friendly. So we're looking at how you can adapt your home to make it more suitable for a person, um, for a deaf person who is living at home, perhaps with the early onset of dementia. And what we want to emphasize is someone like that can still live at home with just a few adaptations to the home environment. So that's the ambition of today. We're not talking about care homes and the kind of provision that is made in care homes. We're talking about if your husband, your wife, your partner, someone in your family develops early onset dementia, what you can do to keep them at home. So maybe you've seen that the BDA has created nine We videos. Now we've been sending them out over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they've been popping up on different formats. And the videos show things like the kitchen, the living room, the bedroom, various settings in the home. And they are going to be the basis of our discussion tonight. Um, because we want to make sure that the information that is covered in the videos that is also available on the website that you can see on your screen at the moment uh, is covered. So if you click on that website, you'll see those nine videos. Have a wee browse to yourself after the discussion tonight. And following our discussion, those videos will make much more sense to you. So I'm not going to blether on by myself all evening. I've brought along two guests to join us to talk about this uh, topic. And my before I invite them on, I would like to give my thanks to the Scottish Government for funding BSL Blethers. Many thanks to them. So let me now welcome our first guest, Dr. Emma Ferguson Coleman. Emma, hello. Hello, how are you? Hello, Avril. Hello, I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Emma, and why you might be here to talk about this? Sure. I am a researcher um, working with deaf people and uh, dementia and, and deaf people with dementia and their carers. I've been doing that for 11 or 12 years and I've been uh, privileged to listen to many of their testimonies, many of their stories. And we've been looking at how these people can carry on living independently at home. Wonderful, I look forward to your contribution. I've got one more guest now, welcome. Hi there. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hello, Emma. Hi. Hi, Avril. Can you introduce yourself? Yes. Hello. My name is Carolyn Denmark. Um, I'm here tonight because um, I have got personal experience of um, my mother, who's deaf, uh, developed dementia, and also my stepfather, Jeff. Um, he also had dementia. But what was interesting was they both had very different journeys, not only for dementia, but remember when my mother had dementia, she was still living with Jeff and they were living at home together. So I've had that experience of supporting them in that situation. But once my mother passed away and Jeff later developed dementia, he was of course living alone. So I've seen those two different experiences and I hope to have an opportunity to talk more about those myself tonight. Also, I've been involved in doing training about, well, deaf dementia training because a lot of deaf people don't know too much about dementia. There's a lot of fear around in the deaf community about that. So I think it's important to do this kind of training, bust some of those myths, make sure the information is clear. So opportunities like tonight are a great opportunity to share information. And I believe very strongly in getting that word out to the deaf community. And, and I believe strongly in us all sharing information to help each other and to help people who do develop dementia and their carers and their families. So thanks ever so much for inviting me on tonight. 
Thank you. I think the three of us have all got quite a lot of experience between us, haven't we? And that we can share with the audience. But before we do start to blether, there might be deaf people here who um, want to make comments or want to ask questions as we progress through our session this evening. So please do do that, post your question, and uh, I've got an eye on the questions coming in and I can pose those to our guests, Emma and Carolyn. Um, but just a reminder that we're looking at the home situation, your own personal home and what we can do to improve that. And we've got an hour to talk about this. So I think the first thing, I mean, there's so much to talk about, isn't there? We could talk for more than an hour, but we're going to have to condense it. Uh, the first thing is, um, well, let's go first to the living room, shall we? Now, how might we think about making the living room more accessible? We do have a video on that, and we've got some photographs that we can show you from that video. and. Um, you know, that might help us stimulate some discussion and bring uh, forth some more ideas. So the first thing I want to show you is a clock in the living room. So let's have a look at that. Okay. So people might be thinking, okay, that's a big yellow clock. Um, can you tell us more about this? Yeah, a clock is obviously very important because it tells you what time it is. Um, but it doesn't just do that. It also has more information like what day it is, what month it is. So I'm going to come back to that later. But this yellow clock that we've just seen is significant because people with dementia um, often get confused whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, um, or, and get confused then about what is happening in the daytime. So the clock is very clear because it lets you know. And at 12 o'clock, six o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock, it's easy to follow. You can see those. And um, there's also digital clocks. I'm sure Emma, maybe you might like to kind of add something at this point. Yeah, I've got a photo that I want to show you from my phone, but do carry on. So let's talk about this big wall clock though. Let's continue to talk about this first. It seems to be large, so that's visible. Why is it yellow? Is there a reason behind that? Is it the contrast with the wall? Could you tell us more about that? It is exactly that. What's important is for people with dementia is that they need to be able to see things very clearly around the room. If you have a clock with a white face uh, on a white wall with hands on, that can look as if it's floating on the wall. So because there's no contrast between that and the wall. So for people with dementia, it's really important to be able to visually locate that information. Remember also that sometimes a person with dementia can struggle with time. So this is why Carolyn's talking about all kinds of different pieces of equipment to help them with that. Um, recognizing whether it's a time of day, whether it's a morning or the evening, and there are things that can help you with that. Let me show you this. Okay, I can see that clearly. That's a good example. So that shows what day of the week it is, what time of day it is, what's the exact hour time, the, the year, the month, it's really clear. So new technology, there's a lot of technology that allows people to see that information. So um, there's all kinds of stuff available, but the yellow clock face is very important to as contrast. It might also be important to talk to your person with dementia about time as well. What time is it outside? Can you see? the time of day outside? Can you see the light? What time is it on the clock? Can you, what time is it? So you might need to, you might find that you need to prove to the person what time it is. If you're doing that with just a watch, that can be a difficult conversation. So some kind of shared point of reference can be really useful. 
okay. And a lot of people with dementia get confused about whether it's daytime or nighttime. So a clock that has a, a rising sun or moon can really help. I mean, people with dementia can often wake at two or three in the morning thinking that it's daytime. So some kind of indicator, visual indicator on the clock can really help, like you're still supposed to be in bed. And that can be really useful. Is there anything else that you can add that can also be useful? Well, you just reminded me actually. Um, we've talked about how important contrast is. So we've talked about clear colors. As I explained earlier, when my mother had dementia, um, she was living with Jeff uh, in a flat. And they had a clock, of course, but um, Jeff had to often help my mother with information, like it's time to do this now, it's time to do this, and digital um, appliances weren't available then. So they used a kind of uh, a rolling dice uh, clock, like it's Monday, it's Tuesday, and so that was a visual display. Also, my mum loved newspapers, the Sun, the Daily Mail, so Jeff would point out the date on the newspaper, so that would really help. Um, now, of course, the, the digital equipment, um, but there wasn't at the time. Uh, when my mother passed away, um, I think, as Emma said, Jeff had six or seven watches, but none of them were any use. He couldn't see the time on his watch. Um, a gold face was difficult to read from. Um, so after some research, we found an, uh, the kind of thing that Emma has shown with a screen that gives all of that information. And of course, Jeff was living on his own, so he very frequently need to check the time because he'd suffer that confusion. So having that digital screen was great. There was one problem, however, that he would have difficulty knowing where was the best place to put it. Now, back then I thought, oh, it might be good to have it next to Jeff's armchair where he sits to watch TV. So it might be a good place to have it there and um, might help him know what programs might be coming on, you know, what day of, 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 and month it is. He'll have that and he'll have his television screen. And I thought that would be great at the time. But then over time, I realized he was still confused. And what was happening was there were too many screens, too much information in one place. He couldn't focus on either the television screen or the clock because they were too close to each other. So looking back, I mean, obviously we made mistakes. It was a learning curve for us. You learn through experience. We realized it was best to put the, the, the display, the clock display on a separate table and leave it there or perhaps on a plain wall and, or on something in front of a plain wall so that Jeff could easily locate it. And, you know, it's nice if you can get that opposite where the person regularly sits. Um, so there are those kinds of things to consider. Yeah, so you've got your clock, now you have to think about where to put it, what best suits the person. Hmm. And also you're talking about buying clocks and sometimes thinking, actually, how do we know it's time for dinner uh, or time to go to the death club? Or So you might need to help with some of those additional prompts um, or things that kind of tie in to times of day um, and, and, be, and, and start to feed those prompts in in good time, you know, it, ahead of the event. Or like, oh, it's seven o'clock, let's watch Coronation Street or EastEnders or something like that. There's so many topics you want to cover. Let's turn to a different uh, topic. Let's talk about TV momentarily because I've just mentioned some soaps there. Um, is there anything we can do in terms of television? Uh, positive and negative things? Any experiences, Emma? Or, well, I'm going to pass to Carolyn, actually, because I know she's got something to say about Coronation Street. Carolyn, well, perfect opportunity to discuss this because my mother was a massive Coronation Street fan. She loved Corrie. She would watch it regularly. And back then, my mother started saying, I've seen this. 
this is a repeat. Why are they repeating this? And I thought, really? What's she talking about? I didn't, back then I didn't understand it. Um, I mean, you know, this is 13, 14 years ago. My mother lived with dementia for nine years. So we're in the early stages here. And she would say, this is a repeat. And I couldn't work it out. It was only about, well, I had to say two or three years later, I realized, of course, these are the same characters from episode to episode. So my mother could recognize the faces of the characters, but she was unable to pick up the storyline. She couldn't understand the storyline. But just seeing the characters, she'd think, I've seen this because I know those characters are boring. I've seen it. So I don't know, Emma, what, I, do you have any further thoughts on that? I agree, Carolyn. Subtitles also are not very easy to follow. We assume because a person is deaf, they're going to use subtitles. But with dementia, this might not be the case. It might affect your ability to read and particularly to speed read uh, subtitles, which can move quite quickly. So often people give up on subtitles, try and work out from the screen what's happening. Um, Sometimes subtitles can be successful, but they can be difficult. So you might want to take the subtitles off. It might be easier for your person with dementia to just try and work out what's going on. Just be aware of that. Um, also, again, when we're talking about television, um, luckily or not luckily, I don't know, there are lots of choices now um, available on our TV screens. And that can be very confusing to someone with dementia. Which channel? Where's my Coronation Street? So um, what we really need is something like an old style TV, you know, where you just walked up and you turn the dial. Those kind of things aren't available now. It's all on remote control, isn't it? So it is a difficult subject, really. There are some strategies, though, that might help. So with your remote control, maybe mask those extra numbers, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and stick with one, two, three, four, five, four, five, six, so that it's more easy for your person with dementia to control the remote. Um, you might need to explain, you know, ITV, maybe they don't know, maybe number three, number four. Um, they might have difficulty remembering what number ITV is. So you need to think about some strategies of how you might help them use the remote. Caroline seems to want, want to add something here. Yeah, um, Jeff used to help my mum uh, watching DVDs or even old VHSs, um, you know, to watch a film together. They had three remotes and that was fine when Jeff was there. But when Jeff got dementia, his journey, his solo journey, trying to manage that on his own and navigate that on his own was very difficult. He couldn't remember which con the remote control was which. So we took away the DVD, we took away the VHS player and just had one remote control that was for the television. And as Emma said, you could put little color stickers like pink stickers on one button, blue sticker on the second button, different colors uh, to help them identify which button, so it's on the pink channel, it's on the yellow channel, it's on the green channel. One problem is that the on off button was very difficult. Some televisions just have a sleep function, so off doesn't mean off, and when you're trying to get it back on again, it goes to sleep. So we just left it all on all the time. Um, so turn your sleep mode off and just have strategies around how you manage that. Well, there are lots of good examples, there are lots of good tips. Can we move us on now to a different room? Um, we'll come back to some more things later, I'm sure. But let's move us on now to talking about the kitchen. Let's look at the kitchen. Now, I'm assuming there are lots of issues that arise in a kitchen. I'd like to show um, just uh, a, 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 an image of good practice with the kitchen cupboards now. Okay, so that's one. And another thing is the fridge, um, as you can see here. Oh, 
Okay. So what do you think about these see-through options? Emma? Yeah, these are wonderful. They're a really helpful idea. Um, and it really helps someone stay independent. If you walk into the kitchen, maybe you've known the kitchen really well for, for many years, but all of your kitchen cupboards are all the same color. So all the handles are the same. They're all going to look the same. So you might not remember where your things are. Where are my baked beans? Which, where, which cupboard are my baked beans in? You might have to you know, open every single one before you get to your baked beans. And that can increase anxiety and frustration to such an extent that they might not bother eating. And losing weight and not eating well isn't a good idea. So these see-through covers are really helpful. And if you can't afford these nice glass see-through cupboards, you could just put pictures, print out pictures and stick them on the outside of your cupboard. So that helps with independence and continuing independence. And you might want to think also about plates and cups and where you store them. And it might be useful to leave them out on the surface or on some display and not put them away in a cupboard so the person doesn't have to continually look for them. Um, you know, maybe you could just leave two or three out on the side or on the kitchen surface. I think Carolyn wants to come and add something to that. Yeah, the kitchen uh, with the see-through cupboards is wonderful. I wish we'd had those back at the time when I needed them. But yeah, if you can't afford those, what I did was I did print out photographs I laminated those and I stuck them on the cupboard doors. Um, I know that that time my mum had lots of different kinds of cups and saucers, you know, different kitchen things, um, the things we women need, lots of kitchen things to make our kitchens feel right. Um, but when my mother passed away and I was looking after Jeff, I had to take those things away and really reduce the number of cups and saucers. And I bought a corner rack, you know, a corner stacking rack. Uh, and I placed that on the workshop, put two plates on it, two dinner plates, two smaller plates, a cup, two cups, two saucers, a couple of mugs. So there's a choice. So you could have a saucer, a cup and saucer or a mug. But also um, with those see-through covers, they're fantastic. I, as I say, I didn't have access to those at the time. But having things in your drawer and things in your uh, in your fridge. I would put on the fridge pictures of sort of eggs, um, pictures of butter, pictures of milk, everyday items that will be stored in the fridge. Not too much information, but like cheese, because I'm thinking of you need protein, you need to eat protein. So I'd take particular photographs of the things that you might need to eat every day. So not all of the different foods that are in the fridge, but the just favorites, the things you might need to eat to stay healthy. Um, so those kinds of things. I think the see-through works well, but I've been advised um, the see-through mugs like this. I've been told they are not suitable for tea or coffee or hot drink because when they're full, people with dementia forget and they think they panic. They think, oh, something's gone wrong with the cup. The, the, the liquid's going to fall out. So have a bright primary color, blue, red, yellow. Um, so I'm interested that the see-through doors work. But I, so it's the way a dementia brain works, right? So the cup, I, I can see that there's shelves and there's doors and there's a door there. And that works. But a mug can be a dangerous thing. Um, so photographs on cupboards is a really helpful tip if you can't afford the see-through doors. Yeah. Yeah, and the see-through might help to reduce the stress with where are the plates and that sort of thing, but you don't want to have too much information. Um, so as you're saying, if you're putting pictures on doors, don't add too many pictures. I think Emma wanted to add something about the kitchen. We've got lots of questions coming in already. Oh, have we? Great, that's a good thing. I just wanted to talk briefly about food. 
and meal planning. Because um, Carolyn was talking about making sure that pictures of the favorite foods or a good balanced diet uh, was available. Um, so you do need to kind of work with your person with dementia to plan um, meals well. And I'll show some examples later. Um, but also buying food. Don't buy too much food, like bulk buying to save money. It doesn't save money anyway, because it's just going to sit in the fridge and uh, it's not going to get eaten. It's going to be wasted, thrown away. So don't fall into the trap of buying too much. Just buy on a weekly basis. So it's much more easy to manage. You can at manage the out of date and the in date. So but make sure that you buy something. Everything that you buy won't go out of date during that week. So don't plan too far ahead. OK, so I remember, yeah, with my father who was on his own and we didn't have see through fridges back in the day, but um, some of the ready-made meals that are available in kind of boxes, um, but they're quite difficult to read the instructions on how to heat, and that was hard. So uh, what I found was a kind of little instruction card, and I'll put a yellow sticker on, and um, that would just say two things, like gas number five, or gas number six, and then the second thing, how long, so 20 minutes, or half an hour, just those two pieces of information. So my dad would pick it up, he'd know that it was gas number five, put it in, half an hour, that's it. And he could watch the clock, get it out, eat it. It, uh, it might not work for everyone, but it work, might work for some people, and particularly in the earlier stages, um, uh, when people are still living independently. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we do, still, we do have questions coming in. Uh, we do have questions that are about the living room. So we're going to kind of skip back a little bit before we go any further in our house. So let's go back to the living room. One we've already answered, but we have Alan, Alice and Brian, uh, a question about for the TV remote, it's often too complicated to operate and there need to be simpler buttons. And I think we've kind of addressed that. Alice, and I hope you spotted some answers to that question about taping over the excess buttons and adding color to existing buttons. And we now have another question from Erin McCluskey, who says, would it be more efficient to have a BSL interpreter on the TV alongside the TV program, or is that distracting for people with dementia? Carolyn mentioned her mom struggled to understand the date and the time on the old clock on top of the TV. Was that because it was two different sources of information at a glance? Wouldn't the sign language interpreter be the same thing? Or is that different? Thanks, Erin, for that question. You're talking about on-screen interpreters. Carolyn? Yeah, that's interesting. It's a good point to raise. Um, back when we were talking about my mother, my mother used FaceTime um, with an app. Um, and that was, you know, old fashioned FaceTime screen. So you could see signing. So um, my sister and our deaf family, we used to, you know, FaceTime with her. Um, but when there was an interpreter on the television, my mother would sign back to the interpreter because she thought they were FaceTiming her. She didn't realize that this was something different. So again, it depends on the person, and their perspective. Everybody with dementia is different and it can affect their vision perhaps sometimes because it depends on the area of the brain that it affects. Um, you know, it's a disease, it affects function and it affects different parts of your brain. So it might be the visual functioning part of your brain. So it's quite difficult to answer some of these things generally, you know. I like that idea of your mom talking to the, to the on-screen interpreter. That's such a wonderful image. Um, Emma, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I think uh, Carolyn makes a good point about um, it's about how the person with dementia receives information. So as you say, you know, the person with dementia thinking that was actually a conversation that they're expected to have. But you need to think about your person with dementia. Think about their signing, um, their kind of 
sense of when they used to sign. An interpreter on screen is kind of quite a modern thing. It might be something that they're not really all that familiar with in terms of their lifespan. So think about how modern that is to your person with de dementia. I'm not a qualified linguist, so um, I haven't really talked to families about whether on screen interpreters are an effective thing or not, and whether people with dementia are comfortable with on screen interpreters and whether they can follow that. I haven't really discussed that with families. But um, people with dementia I know can be easily confused, they easily forget things, they easily misunderstand things, their concentration can be very limited. So if you have somebody on screen for an hour, someone with dementia is unlikely to follow an on-screen interpreter for an hour. 15 minutes is going to be more than enough. Like they need to rest their eyes in a nice bucket, you know, uh, as well as their hands. So really, you need to think about all those different challenges um, with signing on TV. Okay, can we just go to the next question now, which is from Andrew McCafferty. Can I ask you what's better for dementia? Is it black and white or color TV? Which would be better suited for someone with dementia? Thanks for that question, Andrew. Um, when we're talking about televisions, um, we, it's one of the nine videos that we talk about um, that we mentioned on the website that we gave you. So you might want to have a look at that. Um, whether big televisions work better um, or having automatic subtitling or television with uh, black frames or colored frames. Um, you can see a lot of these new TVs have a kind of yellow or silver or good frame around the screen and that can be really helpful. Well, I don't know if the question means watching television programs in black and white and color, or whether you're talking about the frame of the television. Really, as I said earlier, deaf people with dementia can have their vision affected. And it does depend on the individual person. So it might be that the person can't see particular colors better, or so it might be that for one person watching TV in black and white is better, but not for another. So I can't answer this question generally. Um, you know, children's television programs that are very fast paced and colorful and dynamic uh, might not be suitable because that might be too much information for your deaf person with dementia to cope with. So it's the same principle for me. I mean, I come from a deaf family, we're all very visual. Jeff was very visual, but he couldn't cope with the five of us signing at the same time. We had to, deal with him one to one or one to two so we would take shifts on sitting and talking with Jeff and we start you know we gave him our news and the information but we tried to take breaks between topics so uh, you know all of us together was too fast paced for him you know yeah and if I can add to that maybe Andrew you're thinking about the kind of programs that might be suitable for your deaf person with dementia if you can provide, um, you know, those old black and white TVs back in the day, sorry for those talk, born in the 90s, you won't know what we're talking about at this point, but they had programs like Laurel and Hardy, you know, um, exactly, Avril, Laurel and Hardy, those characters. Charlie Chaplin is another one, Charlie Chaplin, a uh, little guy with a moustache and a stick. Um, Harold Lloyd was another famous one. Yeah, the famous clock scene, that's right. And he was on top of the building. Yeah, exactly, those films. We're showing our age here, we're showing our age. But though that films from the black and white era are very suitable because there's no language, there's no subtitles, there's no English. You can watch the action, they're very enjoyable. Something like Coronation Street, as Carolyn said, can be, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't follow what they're talking about. I can't follow the dialogue. The subtitles are difficult to follow. And these are the same characters. So, so those old black and white movies can be very useful and really enjoyable for your person with dementia. And those born after the 1980s, I'm sure you still have access to these kind of films. 
Um, you can, uh, you know, black and white films of dogs and things, you know, those are not long ago. You can find those, go back through the archive, see what you can find. Okay, we've got one more question, then I'm gonna move it on to a different room. Um, this question is about the kitchen. Uh, and again, it's Erin wanting to ask a question about the kitchen, Erin. So are people with dementia encouraged to cook for themselves and under supervision, or is that, does that help them to continue to use their brain, or is that discouraged? Okay, I'm gonna put that question to Emma first, I think, because you know more about the brain and how it functions. Can you answer that one, Emma? Yeah, thanks for that, Erin. That's a very interesting question. Um, I am very passionate about making sure that people with dementia continue to live as independently as possible and as actively as possible. Um, they may need support to achieve that, but they can do things themselves. It just means that you need to plan um, and do a kind of risk assessment. How accessible is the kitchen? What are the risks there? What are you might need bright utensils. You might need to um, be very careful about the colors of knives and spoons. Think about the kind of equipment that's available in the kitchen. Um, the cooker, for example, you have to think about your cooker. Is it gas? Maybe the person with dementia um, might leave the gas on, not realize, walk off. So remember that concentration is an issue for people with dementia. So is gas going to be an issue with that? Um, might they be easily confused? You know, you get, you might put the kettle on, you might leave it. Person with dementia will know they put the kettle on, but they might be thinking back to other times. They might take an electric kettle, put it onto their hob and melt it. So you've got an electric kettle that's made of plastic but they might have a sudden flashback to how they used to use the kettle, which was to put it on the hob. So they might take this new electric kettle, put it on the hob. So those kinds of things can be a health risk or a fire risk indeed. So you have to continually keep an eye on what's going on with that person with dementia and the level of independence they can achieve with support, with guidance. Try not to um, make high risks, try and evaluate those risks, try your best to keep them going, to keep them independent, to keep them as confident as possible, that's important. But the brain function is not going to improve. From diagnosis, it's a question of living with it, and you might plateau, there might be some medication that helps them function um, in the way that they are. An isolated person without Stimulation without conversation can uh, deteriorate. So, but we were aiming to keep that person on a level to keep them with support, living as independently as possible. Maybe you've got someone popping in three times a day to cook with them, making sure they're eating. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, so, planning time to pop in and just check on that person, make sure they're comfortable. Is everything going all right? Think about cooking together, perhaps, because they're still independent, they're still doing it, but you're doing it sociably. So it's, it's important to try not to take away all that independence. Thanks for that question. Carolyn, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say Emma's right. Um, with training, we're always saying, don't do it for them engage with them in doing it. It's important for the person's well-being that they're still able to do things. But like Emma said, the example of putting the electric kettle on the hob made me smile because I've seen Jeff do that. Um, you know, not his fault, but as you say, just had a flashback of thinking, oh, this is what I do with the kettle, I put it on the hob. Um, and the, you know, those old retro vintage shops, you know, they have whistling kettles, the retro shops, Avril, sorry, the old fashioned, yeah, retro shops. They call it retro, like vintage shops. Um, you can find these kind of things online. It's like uh, revisiting the old things that they had. So you get a, a kettle that you can put on the hob with a 
thing on it that makes it whistle when it boils. So that might be useful. Maybe put the electric kettle away, don't use it. Try and encourage the person to still carry on being in their home, but take away those risks. Give them a, 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 hob, a kettle they can put on the hob and take the electric one away. Okay, that's great. Let's move on to a different room now, shall we? Let's go to um, the dining room. Um, and let's talk about dinner time and those kinds of issues. I want to show you how I was going to say a video. Um, uh, not a video. Can we show um, a photograph of a menu board? Okay. This, I think, is a brilliant idea because people often kind of go, oh, dinner, what, what could I have for dinner? So having that menu board there is really helpful and hopefully that will help them think, okay, I could have three courses or I could have three meals or whatever. So um, is that a good thing? Is that a good idea? What are our thoughts on that? Well, with Jeff, I get, my mother was very different because again, Jeff was with her, but when Jeff was on his own, we had a whiteboard and we would put on that um, things, you know, so that he knew what was happening, like, the carers coming today. So we'd have photographs of the carer. So he knew that person today and we'd have Monday, Tuesday, the days of the week laid out and we put that person's photograph on the day of the week. Um, and then we had a separate board, another whiteboard in the kitchen, which had pictures of dinner um, and his favorite food. And the carer know he would know his favorite food they say, would you like that? And they'd find the picture and they'd put those things on. Because what is very common is that in the carer will arrive and say, have you eaten? And they say, yes. And they go, what have you eaten? I don't know. So the carer would go into the kitchen and go, oh, have you eaten that? Oh, you've had a banana and you've had a, a sandwich, bread and butter, great. It does help as well with food planning. Um, what do you want to eat this week? You know, there's seven whole days and you have to kind of think about, wow, what am I gonna eat? So pictures can help with that one. Do you want this? Do you want that? So, and that also helps obviously with the, with the shopping because you've chosen the food already. And then through the day, people with dementia can, re can become repetitive. You know, I haven't eaten, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten, I'm hungry, or I have eaten. So again, you can see the pictures and say, you've just, you just eaten this, okay? Okay, are you still hungry? Let's go and have a look at what you might also eat, maybe some, a piece of fruit or a biscuit. It can help you have a conversation with the person with dementia so that they can feel a bit more comfortable about the decisions that they're making. Um, you know, it might be that five minutes later they've forgotten and you've got some kind of visual clue, you've got some information, shared point of reference to say, Oh, remember, we, we've just done this. We, we've, had, we've had that meal. So it can really help with communication around eating. I've noticed um, that with people in the room, it's better to eat with them. They won't eat alone. People don't like eating alone. So what I did with Jeff was I'd have cake and biscuits and crisps and things. And I put them, well, people with dementia tend to like uh, finger food you know, things that you can get on the table um, because you can see that the food is there. If they get hungry, they can look down and go, oh, there's food there, okay. Um, so that they don't have to, you know, the effort of cooking and making a meal can sometimes be too much. Um, and that's when you might need support. So to have some snacks available is good. So when you're showing photographs, are you showing photographs of plates and things? Let's have a look at something like that. Can we see that photograph? So we can see there that there are different colors of plates and mugs um, and different kinds of crockery there. Can you maybe pick a couple of things to talk about from this photo each? Yeah, sure. The first thing is the contrast. You'll notice again, the color contrast. 
And that's important because when the person sits down, they need to be able to see the plate, the knife and the fork and the spoon contrasted with the table. If all of those colours are the same, they're not going to be able to locate those items on the table. As we've mentioned before, um, vision can be difficult and connecting the stimulus that you're getting from your eye to the brain can be difficult. So contrast can really help you recognise those things more easily. And Carolyn has a fantastic point about being with Jeff, because, again, it, it, it is helpful to remember. If they've had somebody with them with, with their meal, they'll remember that. If they ate something on their own, they might not remember it. You know, if they had some company, um, they can also copy that company. And it's a sociable, comfortable thing. They can remember, they can copy how to eat. What do we do here at the table? Um, you know, and again, with washing up and things, that's easier. Um, it helps the deaf person remember, the person with dementia remember how to do washing up and what to do next because they're copying you. Yeah, white plates are not a good idea. You think white plates are going to be good, um, but if you have mashed potato, how are you going to see mashed potato on a white plate? It, there's no contrast, it's really difficult. So I would recommend blue plates, red plates. Those things give you a really clear, or yellow, they give you a really clear contrast, but don't use white plates, they're not helpful. Okay, so Carolyn, you mentioned earlier something as well about oh, the see-through mug, um, making someone with dementia think that that was gonna be dangerous. So, if there's orange juice in that see-through mug, is that going to be helpful? Or again, are they going to think it's going to fall through? Are there positive and negative sides to this? Okay, great. So what we're wanting to stress here is that you should watch the video, watch these uh, from the website, watch these nine videos, have a look at the kind of colors and contrast, shapes of things like curved bowls so that the food doesn't fall out of the bowl and not like to spill things on them. Um, flat plates, again, uh, risk of spilling and embarrassment and, and social embarrassment. So plates with a lip and bowls that, that curve inward. Okay, before we move on to a different room, um, we're gonna talk about the bedroom. And the first thing we're gonna see about the, the bedroom is the wardrobe. Let's have a look at that. Great, again, we've got a see-through wardrobe. It's fantastic, yeah. So a see-through wardrobe, what, do, what are we looking at here? Why are we looking at it? Carolyn, I don't know. It helps you to decide what you want to wear. That can sometimes be difficult. It can be difficult to remember where the clothes are. Maybe the person with dementia walks into the room and sees a lot of doors and drawers and thinks, where am I? What's in those cupboards? I don't know. Um, where are your clothes? I don't know. And this can be very stressful for the person with dementia. The see-through wardrobe can immediately resolve that. It also gives you choice. Oftentimes what happens is that a person with dementia has their choice removed. Their ability to decide for themselves is removed. Perhaps the family's coming and saying, I'll choose your clothes for you. Here, wear this jumper. Here, wear these trousers. Here, wear this shirt. Whereas the deaf person with dementia might want to choose for themselves. If they know what's fair, they can choose their own outfit. And again, that really helps with confidence boosting. Yeah, my mum loved her clothes. She had so many clothes. And they didn't have see-through wardrobes back in the day. So, and it was all, all difficult because Jeff was a man, he had no interest in clothes. So this is a question of choice. What we decided to do, my sister and I, was um, of course my mother had lost weight because she also had a stroke as well as dementia. So we thinned the wardrobe down and we left seven of her favorite outfits and we would bring them out to show my mum and say, which one would you like to wear? Um, so we do like a little bit of a fashion show. And eventually we also took photographs and put them in an album. And my mother could kind of flick through, you know, when she, when she was with Jeff, 
or with a carer. Um, the carers knew that my mum was a very proud person. She always wanted to be colour coordinated, well turned out. She didn't like wearing crazy, uncoordinated, contrasting things. She liked, um, that was very, uh, it was one of my mum's values. It was very important to her. So reducing the number of clothes meant that she was making good use of fixed outfits. Now with Jeff, it was very different. When my mum was gone, with Jeff, we had to have just seven pairs of pants, seven pairs of socks, uh, seven, you know, two sets of pajamas, um, so that he could see these on the shelf. We didn't have hangers. We just put everything on shelves, and he had a choice from those things. But I agree absolutely with Emma. It's really not about being told what you should wear at all. Yeah, when I look back to my experience with my father, he would open cupboards and. Uh, if you have a, 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 a hanging rail that is deep front to back, you tend to use the first outfit all the time. So you need a, a hanging rack that runs horizontally side to side, don't you? So that you can see more outfits and kind of flick through them. So, uh, you know, I think that can be useful because otherwise you're just ending up wearing the same outfit week in, week out. Um, so, yeah, that's something to consider as well. Yeah, and one thing I think is important in the bedroom is you need a chair in the bedroom. Really important. Because what happened with Jeff again and again was he would fall. Because when he was changing and he was sitting on the bed, the mattress is smooth and soft and Jeff would slide off the mattress onto the floor. So a chair is much better, enables you to sit down, to put on your briefs or your trousers. Um, and then when they're putting pajamas on, they also have this drawstring at the front, and that can be very risky because with the to you know when you go to the toilet, you can forget to tie that up again, or because you're losing weight, you forget to tie that up again. Your pajamas fall down, you fall over. So what would I I would advise is try to buy pajamas with elasticated waist. That's much safer, or put some elastic in to existing pajamas. That, are, that have been previously been drawstrings. So make sure you have slippers that can uh, fasten on so that that's not a risk of falling as well. Everyone thinks that the biggest risks are in the kitchen, but honestly, the biggest risks for Jeff were in the bedroom when he was on his own. I'd like to add one more thing that I really like that Carolyn mentioned that Carolyn has, which is a blanket I absolutely love. So can we show a photograph of this blanket? Thank you. Can you tell us a bit about this blanket and, and what other pictures on it? Oh, it's very powerful to see that actually, because my mum loved family. She was, it was so important to her. She would always talk about family. Um, you know, there are, we're sixth generation deaf, we're all, we're all deaf. And with dementia, it can be very difficult, very confusing and very fear inducing to know who is who. So, my mum had a really difficult time in the hospital at one stage um, and she went into very sheltered housing. So, uh, yes, it was uh, she had her own flat, but there was a carer downstairs and upstairs. So we had to plan bedtimes and things, make sure that she went to bed on her own. Um, my mother was quite fearful. So we had this blanket with photographs of everybody in the family. We ordered it from a photo print shop. We designed it um, and her whole life from kind of childhood onwards was represented in the photographs on that blanket. Her brothers, her mother, her father, all of her children, all of her grandchildren. And that was really specific to her. So I would really advise you to make that kind of memory blanket because it's so visual, it made her feel so safe. And it was really important that, that the other thing with people with dementia is they think that everyone's forgotten them. So it was really important so that she felt loved. Yeah, and that might be something that the deaf community think about. And it can also be a conversation starter, can't it? Who's this? You can talk about them. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're repeating stories yet, yeah, you can just talk about it. Yeah, exactly. You know, because, yeah, 
Okay, we're running out of time, but let's move on to talking about the toilet and the bathroom. And again, we have another photograph to show you here. Very colorful. Um, so that's the first thing I noticed. Uh, red, um, yellow, and blue, I think it was, wasn't it? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the contrast of colors. If you've got a white seat on a white toilet bowl against a white wall, it is visually very challenging. So what we're trying to offer is a contrast between the seat and the toilet bowl, so the person knows where they're supposed to sit. Um, it can make it more comfortable, more easy, rather than trying to find where the toilet is. Um, yeah, Jeff um, had this kind of issue with sitting on the toilet. You know, my husband was there at the time, but he was going on and on about, I want the toilet, I want the toilet. And we realized it was because it was all the same color. He thought he was sitting on a chair. He was in fact sitting on the toilet but he didn't know where he was sitting because it was very confusing. There's no color contrast. So that's really important. So contrasting color is good, but try to avoid using black because black can be problematic for people with dementia. Um, black, I think we've already talked about um, if we've got a black TV screen, you don't know whether it's off or it's on. Also, it looks like a black hole. And there's some, also when you're walking along outside, um, a puddle can look like a black hole on the pavement that you might fall into. So wearing black, um, being surrounded by black doesn't help, but maybe that's for another time. So when you're talking about the home and the bedroom and the toilet, whatever, try to avoid black um, and maybe not black slippers because they think they're going to fall down, maybe not a black mat. Um, so try and avoid those kinds of things in the home. Black can look like a hole. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, in the bathroom, please don't use mirrors. Mirrors can be very challenging for your person with dementia because you might not recognize yourself. Who is that old person? Um, and who is that old person in my home? Um, so the person with dementia might be thinking of themselves as they were at 35. They might, so they might be thinking that they've got long dark brown hair and they look in the mirror and there's this silver haired person there with wrinkles and a, and a wattle. And they think, well, that's, that's not me. Um, so they can start to argue with that person. So I would recommend that you cover mirrors and to reduce that anxiety. Yeah, it's really important. My mother um, in her flat, they had a list um, and my mum was in a wheelchair at that time. Um, and then the lift was entirely mirrored. So I would put my mother in the wrong way, actually, you know, in her chair, so that she was looking at, not at the mirrors, but looking at the door. And um, so really try to avoid mirrors. Yeah, very important. Okay, I think we've covered quite a lot of things there. I just want to add a couple of things to talk about. Um, keys to the house, because um, that can be quite confusing. We've got a photograph for you here. Obviously, keys, if you've got no key, you can't get in the house, so they're very important. But, um, you know, we can have too many keys, can't we? So you need a kind of house key, maybe different hooks to hang these things on rather than one solid key ring with all of the hooks hanging on. Keep them separately. What do you think? Is that a good idea? And secondly, um, you might want to have um, different things on the door. So like if you're in a hallway, all the doors leading off the hallway might look the same. So you might want something to identify each door, maybe different colors or different pictures. You could print out things and put them on the different doors just to reduce that hallway anxiety of where am I and where am I going? Emma? Yeah. 
also, um, you know, each door has a frame and sometimes the door and the frame and the cut and the wall can all be the same color. So again, adding contrast can really help mobility. Maybe make the door frame red or yellow so that you know that you're going into a space. It can just give you a clue that there's a door there. Yeah, and as we said earlier, you know, if you, you're in a, an old person's home with a carer downstairs, um, it can be really useful to have a photograph on the front door who lives here, you know. So this is my door. I'm not going into the wrong flat. This is my flat. I live here. It's a photograph of me. And also maybe, not just on the door, but outside the house, sometimes, you know, if you have door facings or, you know, um, fences along the street, the fence can be black. Everybody's fence in the street might be black. You don't know which entrance to your house is yours. So maybe make your fence yellow, paint your fence yellow or paint your front door a different color so that the person walking down the street goes, oh, yeah, it's the one with the yellow fence or it's the one with the, is this a good idea, do you think? Yep, absolutely. So that it's more friendly for, for the person with dementia, reduces stress, encourages independence. And um, yeah, anything that you'd like to add to that? No, absolutely right. Emma, did you want to say something more? I, I do think it's really important to think about your home and how easy um, your home, how identifiable your home might be to the person with dementia walking down the street. Maybe they can't remember the number, maybe they can't remember the name. So something visual to really give them a clue um, to, that, that's friendly to them, that makes them attracted to that house and makes them know that it's their home. Okay, we're just gonna take some last questions before we close. This is from Malika Rose, Malika Rose. We used to use a sticker for where the zero was on the dial on the oven. So we're talking about cooking. So she knew she had to line up the cooker, the stickers, and that meant she'd finished cooking. Is that a good solution? Is this a good tip, folks? Uh, yeah, I used um, black marker pen, but really, to make a really thick line to really exaggerate that line um, and make sure it was a non-washable one so it was permanent marker or an arrow can be really helpful um, it's the same with switches as well um, sometimes you get two switches one does this and one does that so i would put i would tape over one and put you know this you know an arrow this one um, you know, that kind of thing, just draw on because it, it can be complicated and confusing. Okay, and finally, um, everybody knows there are white switches on the, the wall for lights and so on. Um, is it useful to have those switch plates in different colors? Yeah, or put a border on them, okay, like a yellow border or something. So if you're trying to find a switch on the, the vast expanse of the wall, yes. Yeah some kind of border that contrasts around the outside of the switch because otherwise we're not going to see it. And remember in the bedroom, what's important at night is that you might be going to the toilet in the dark. So have a kind of plug-in night light. Uh, think about that. So the person can get up out of bed. They might not know where the lamp is. They might not. So you've got an automatic lamp that comes on, a light that comes on as soon as they move and that will give that will just be that much safer. Okay, we've got a question coming in about food. Um, so you've got kind of chicken on the, what, how do you change the plan? Uh, so the person thinks I, I, I'm getting chicken today and then they're offered something different. How confusing might that be? Yeah, what's important? And I wish all carers could sign, but they don't. Good communication is really important. Be able to explain the chicken's gone. No chicken at the shop. It's all gone. We've got fish now. Fish today, chicken tomorrow. Fish today, chicken tomorrow. Just to reassure that person, then that's fine. If you can just do that, just that bit of communication, it will stop any 
anxiety or any ag aggressive behavior as a result of that. And don't forget that if you're cooking together, that can really be lovely. You know, oh, there's no chicken. Oh, let's do chicken another night. Okay. So again, it comes back to communication and working together with the person. You know, no chicken. It's run out. Um, we've got meat. We've got vegetables. Should we do this together? Yeah. Okay. Work collaboratively. Try to make decisions in collaboration with each other rather than deciding for the person. Carolyn, you want to add something? Well, we've been talking for an hour and we just need so much, there's so much more to say. I think we could talk for a full day on this topic because there's a lot to cover. There's so much you can do. I absolutely agree. This is a good starting point, I think, to bring some tips to our audience. I would encourage you to have a look at those videos that we've made, the nine videos on our website. Have a look at that. There's a lot of information there. There's also this discussion. Um, but before we close, I mean, I'm not surprised that an hour has passed so quickly. Um, Carolyn, Emma, any final comments, any final thoughts on how to make your home more dementia friendly? Last comments before we close. Um, Colin? Okay, I'd say the most important thing in your home is to make sure that it's accessible and safe. And also people with dementia love photos. They're important. So photo albums, um, frames, photos, those plug-in photos that circulate different photos coming up, those things can be great. Um, so a person with dementia can feel loved, they can feel that they still belong, that they're not left out and abandoned. And that's really important because we often see that. Often people have hobbies, so find out about their hobbies. Maybe there are photographs of things that they did, like, oh yeah, I went cycling around Europe once, and it can just, spark a story, spark a connection. Uh, it can really, photos can really help bring something out of the person. Emma. For me, talking about how to make the person's home dementia friendly, um, remember that they've been living in that house for many years probably, and that they want to carry on living in that house for as long as possible. So try and think about how you can make sure that happens. Think about the family, think about the, that person's needs. Think about everything you can do to try and make them carry on. Try not to change too quickly. Um, talk to them early. Don't make changes at the last minute. Give them clues, give them tips. Um, help them understand the changes that are being made. Enable that person to live independently, maybe with family support, for as long as possible. And then when change do, does come, you, you know, if you've got dementia, don't go, okay, we're dealing with dementia, let's change everything now. Work in conjunction with that person, introduce changes gradually, and it's important to be open in your communication and your conversations about it. Okay, I'm going to bring this conversation to a close. Thank you very much for your contributions. I hope our audience have enjoyed watching this this evening. I hope you've learned something this evening. I hope we've given you some tips um, that you, your friends, your family will find useful either now or in the future um, to enable deaf people with dementia to try and live at home as long as possible until perhaps they get uh, the situation becomes so difficult and they do have to move to um, specialist care. Thank you very much to our guests tonight for your time. You've both been wonderful. I hope, audience, you've enjoyed it. Good night. Thank you very much.